Cardinals turn over to page 224. So Bobby's playing 224. I know whom I have believed. I know not my God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known. More why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know who I have believed then am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Verse 4. I know not what of good or real may be reserved for me. Of weary ways or golden days before this face I see. But I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed. Unto him against that day and the last. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the bell with him or meet him in the air. But I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. Dad? All right, thank you, Brian. If y'all are warm, the air conditioner's on up the front and the heat's on in the back, so whatever. Someone gave me a t-shirt, very nice of them. Said this, I promise not to sleep in church. Especially during the sermon, I'll read the Bible and say my prayers. I promise not to sing off key and always arrive on time. I promise not to complain when the basket is passed around. I will never chew gum in church or sneak out early because I am the minister. I am the minister. I am the minister. So thank you for that t-shirt. All right. The message today is on transformation. And of course, the two main verses on transformation, there's a lot in the Bible, but two of the main ones is Romans 12, 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We'll probably look at 30 different verses of Scripture or more tonight and uh, quote them. We'll have them on the screen. Also, I admonish you to turn there in your Bibles just so you can mark it. Especially when we get to Psalms 19, there's some... Tremendous verses in Psalms 19. You need to circle and go back and read them again and again and again. And you'll see how God can transform you in His Word. Have you ever had a situation that you just did everything under the sun to fix and it just didn't get fixed? Well, this message tonight will show you how to get things fixed. And they're not the way we think they are. A lot of times we think we fix things in the energy of our flesh. We just think we have enough intelligence or enough physical ability or enough charisma or enough talent to just make things work our way. But sooner or later in life we come to that place where we find out we're just not as sharp as we thought we were. And so the message tonight will help you to come to that place where you can have so much in life if you'll learn this fantastic truth tonight. Okay? Let's pray. Precious Father, help us to learn to spend that time with you that we always talk about. I know sometimes people probably get tired of hearing about abiding and studying and seeking your face. And yet, Lord, you've told us that because you know that truth we just shared. Sometimes in life... We do wish things would turn around, things would get better. We pray and hope that our prayers of what we pray will be answered. We'd like to see 
our nation go in a different direction. We'd like to see our school systems begin to teach morality again. We'd like to see a lot of things happen, Lord. And because they don't, we can get discouraged. And yet you're teaching us something tonight to keep us on the mountaintop, to keep us afloat, aflight, as we walk with you. We pray, God, that you'll work in each of our lives, our minds tonight, to transform us so that our lives might count the more for you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Romans 12, 1, I beg of you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice, present your bodies, that is, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Has, has anyone ever asked you to do something that is only reasonable? I mean, after all, son, you sleep in this house. The least you can do is make up your bed. It's only reasonable, you know. I mean, son, you sleep in this house. The least you can do is, is my grandson and granddaughter's been with me for the next couple of weeks. And I already told Caleb, well, Monday the grass needs cutting. Charity, tomorrow the house needs cleaning. You say, preacher, those are your grandkids? Yeah. And you know what? They say, great, Papa, we'll do it. Isn't that good? They didn't ask for money yet. Isn't that good? And the Lord says, only reasonable that you just sell out to God. Now, it'll never make sense if you don't do something with that verse. Think on it. Meditate on it. Abide in it. Read it over and over and over again. And you'll finally figure out, well, Lord, I think that thing's true. And then you ask the question, verse 2, how do we do it? Two things, don't quit acting like this world. Quit thinking like this world. Quit trying to be politically correct. Did you hear where the, one of the justices, who was he that spoke at the college? Which one? Who talked about we need to get away from being politically correct? One of the Supreme Court justices this past week. Praise God. He must have heard my message. Don't worry about being politically correct. Just be loving, be kind, be gentle, and be bold. And speak God's Word just as He has written it. So be not conformed to this world, but be ye metamorpho, metamorphosis. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, abiding, meditating, thinking, that you may prove to your friends and prove to this world what? What is good? God is good. And acceptable. What does God accept? Quit trying to please men. Quit trying to please everybody else. Live to please one person. Almighty God. Through Jesus Christ. And do His perfect will. And you can have the joy of the Lord if you want that. The word for meta or transformed is metamorpho. I already told you that. It's the word we get, metamorphosis. Uh, in the Greek, it means to change. And the great example we give about that is a beautiful butterfly. Now, what was that butterfly before it became a beautiful butterfly? Same thing you were, a worm. That's right. Have you ever thought about metamorphosis? Mama takes that. Mama's got the intuition from God to lay that egg on a certain plant that has tender leaves. If that egg is not laid on a certain plant with tender leaves, that egg will die. And for a child to be birthed into the kingdom of God, they need God's love. God's seed is powerful. It's got everything in it to give life when a person's born again, but that child needs love. And when that little egg finally hatches, a larva comes out of it, and that larva must eat on love. I'm trying to put the spiritual analogies in there. I mean, everyone needs love. You can't, you can't do away with this, kind, this idea of being kind and gentle and loving and, 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 and beautiful to people and joyful to people and peaceful. People got to see our love and they got to want what we have. Well, as that larva does eat upon the, the um, uh, plant, the leaves, 
it becomes a, a, a goes to the pupa stage. And in the pupa stage, it literally eats and dies and eats and di- not really die, but it eats and outgrows its skin five times. And as it outgrows its skin, it goes to a larger skin, a larger skin, and a larger skin. That's known as molting, okay? And so it molts and it comes out and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it eats. And the last stage is the chrysalis stage where the pupa goes through metamorphosis. Now, when this change takes place, scientists that study what transpires chemically inside this caterpillar or worm, they say that the enzymes that come forth should kill that creature. They should kill it, but instead of it dying, it comes forth in a transformed state into a beautiful butterfly. And my friend, that is so spiritual. That is so spiritual. God's egg has to be planted in our heart, and because we love Him, because we see His love, we feed on that tender love. We feed on that tender love. We feed on that tender love, and we grow, and we become more mature, and we become more mature, and more spiritual, and more spiritual, and more spiritual into our lives until we become like Jesus Christ. There's so many analogies you can make. You can make salvation through that, but one of the better analogies is dealing with the doctrine of sanctification. And what sanctification is in the Bible, there's actually three stages to it. The first stage is immediate sanctification, and that takes place when you're born again. You're immediately sanctified. That's where the Bible says His righteousness is imputed to you. You have His righteousness. In other words, hey, you're going to be a butterfly someday. Don't wait till you die to become that butterfly. God wants us to be that butterfly now. So there's immediate sanctification where we see His love. When we see His love, what happens to us? We, we realize, man, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm a sinner. I need to repent. I need to believe on Jesus Christ. We see, and we make these changes in our life. And after a person is born again, then they come to that second place where they enter the, uh, what we call immediate sanctification, progressive sanctification. And progressive sanctification, what has been happening in your life ever since you got saved. You've been growing and coming out of that skin. Boy, you know what? I was pretty fleshly there. And you grow another a spiritual level. And you go, wow, you come out of that skin. You say, man, I didn't realize how fleshly I was there. And you go from these stages, you learn to, to seek the Lord and then study His Word and then abide in His Word and then to worship Him in spirit and truth and then to give your life to prayer and service and you go through these stages. And then when you finally get to, and this should be that last picture, I think we got ahead of one there, Chad. The third one is sanctification in the respect or the ultimate or final sanctification, and that is when we see Christ, we shall be like Him. And that's 1 John 3 and verse number 2. When He shall appear, we shall see Him, or we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And so one of these days we're going to leave this world, we're going to be like Christ. We're going to have that glorified body where we appear and disappear Remember when Jesus was on the cross? I'll just share this with you. Remember in Psalms 22 where we read, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you go through that chapter and many of those words and verses are the thoughts of Christ upon the cross as well as the thoughts of David through what he was going through in his, in his day. But he says one thing when he was on the cross. He says, I am a worm and no man. And we are but worms until we become like Christ. And the Lord was saying, I am still a man until I am transformed. How about that? And our goal in life should be to so walk and abide in love and spend time with Him and renew our minds so that we metamorphosize. We become more like Christ. 
I mean, I, 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 every day, that's a heart wish of mine and a prayer of mine. God, I know I need to abide. I need to think. I need to sit at your feet. I want to grow. I want to feed upon your precious word. And that's the key, feeding on God's word. I, I can't get over that. I can't explain it away enough. You can try to do good all the days of your life. You can say, I'll be a better person tomorrow. I'm not going to say the things I used to say. I'm not going to do the things I used to do. And I'm not going to go to the places I used to go. And I promise you, you do everything you just said you wouldn't do. The only thing that can stop you is to abide, to spend time meditating in God's Word. Just think about that. A 12-legged pest, a worm, metamorphosizes in 180 different life-changing character plates, characteristics take place in that worm's life. God gave us that worm, that butterfly, that metamorphosized to teach us that when we get saved, there ought to be some changes in our life. And when people look at us, we ought to quit looking like the worms of this world and look more like a butterfly reflecting His light. Don't you think so? And that's what the Lord wants us to be. So how do we become transformed? Well, we begin by gaining knowledge of a person. If you want to be transformed, then you gain knowledge about a person or a thing or a hobby. If you think on fishing, if you, how many of you like to fish? If you get to thinking on fishing, my, 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 my son-in-law, Brother Jeff, he likes to fish, he likes to hunt, he likes to drive four-wheelers. He likes to play. He likes. He bought him a boat the other day, a pontoon boat. Boy, he likes toys. <laughs> Some people just like toys. And that's life. But we need to get to that place where we enjoy abiding in the things of the Lord. And He'll do some great things for us. So how do we become transformed? Number one, we gain knowledge. Colossians verse 3 and verse 10 says, And having put on the new man, okay, I'm saved now, what should I do? Which is renewed in knowledge as I learn what his image is that was created in me. Isn't that fantastic? So you say, preacher, how do I change? It takes learning. It takes gaining knowledge. It takes getting seeds in my mind of my head and the mind of my heart and the mind of my gut. And he'd say, preacher, how often should I come every Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night? I wish you would. Good crowd tonight. Thank you for being faithful. It really does encourage the preacher. I know him. It really encourages him when y'all come out. And thank you and encourage others to come out and do the same for your Sunday school class and just be faithful. It encourages everybody. But how do we gain this knowledge? And how often should we learn? If you would, look in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. It says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Day by day and through each... Wa -da -da -da. That's all I know. My wife tells me that a lot. She said, you know, you start songs, you never finish them. I said, I don't remember the words. But I still like to hum them. My grandkids said, Papa, you make up words to the song. I said, I know, I'm getting old. But uh, how many of you eat breakfast nearly every morning, nearly every morning, and, and lunch, and supper? It's a habit. Do you know if you ate a big enough breakfast, you could skip lunch and just eat supper? You say, don't even say that, preacher. That sounds sinful. You mean do away with my 10 o'clock snack and my 2 o'clock snack? Okay, let's get back to the Bible. Now, there are many dangers out there. One danger to why people don't spend time with the Lord is the Internet. <laughs> Let me tell you a story I didn't put in your book, and it's true. Uh, the Internet can put in many bad situations. Uh, I've heard stories like this happen in, in family members. Um, not any immediate ones, but uh, where girls would get on the internet. And from just reading words that guys are, guys they never met. They're just reading these 
words of, oh, I'd like to meet you, and I, I, I think after talking with you these many days, I'm falling in love with you. And they never meet this person, but they're persuaded by his words that she wants to meet this person. And they make plans to leave their homes without their parents knowing about it. And though they never met, now I, I, we say, preacher, what are you saying? If you spent time with the God of heaven that you have never seen and read his words, you too would make plans to run off with him. That's what I'm saying. Isn't that interesting? Because his words are lovely and his words are beautiful if we would just spend that precious time with him. Many of you have heard of the great uh, missionary to China, Hudson Taylor. And Hudson Taylor was a nice looking young man. At the age of 18, he was tremendously dedicated to God. In his journal, he would write how he would lay prostrate before God, begging God to, to make him the man he should be for his glory. He disciplined his life. He changed his diet, began to eat rice in England for uh, years before he ever went over to China. And how he would just showed out to God and he vowed to God by saying, God, when I get to China, I have no claim on anyone for anything. My only claim will be on you, God. Boy, that's pretty good for an 18-year-old boy. That just and, and, and after a year on the mission field, the, the mission society that sent him cut off all support. And he spent the rest of his life on the mission field depending on God. I think if God can support you on the mission field, He can take care of you in college. What do you think about that one? No amens there either. Okay. In spite of Hudson Taylor's maturity at his age, going to the mission field at the age of 21, diligent and disciplined, uh, he was unprepared to deal with the actions of other missionaries and the conflicts he had in his own soul. Still a young man in his 20s, about 8 years, probably 29 at this time that these conflicts took place. But you want me to tell you what they were? Other missionaries talking about him. Can I tell you some of the biggest problems you're going to have? Other people talking about you. If you do right, stand right, live right, walk right, other people talk about you. Other Christians will talk about you. You've got to come to that place where you do what you do because you abide in God's Word and you know God is telling you to do it. Not because the preacher said it, but because God is telling you what to do. And because they talked about him, it developed thoughts of insecurity within himself. He got discouraged. He went back to England. I'll tell you more of the story Sunday night. Well, if I preach Sunday night. He went back to England discouraged, walking the seashore saying, God, what do I do? I think we all go through that sometimes in our life. He said this, some of the greatest troubling thoughts were how other missionaries perceived him. Those thoughts contribute to his own thoughts not being what they should be. And he realized as difficult as he tried to be good, it just seemed like he couldn't. Now, I don't know what his sins were. Just being negative condemning himself. But here was his prayer. He said, I hate myself, my sin, and yet I gain no strength against it. You ever felt like that way? I just can't get out of this rut. I just can't get over it. What these people are saying back to me, I'm bitter at them. I'm mad at them. I'm angry at them. I, I don't know how to get victory over it. I think that's what he was saying. An older, wise, Christian man sent him a letter. Just in time. Listen to old people with gray hair. And that old man sent him the letter. Well, this is one of his prayers. He said, every hour for every day my sins oppress me. And this young man, this old man sent him a letter. It gave him the secret to the spiritual life. And this was what he told Hudson Taylor. He said, number one, let the Savior work in you and do His will. He said, preacher, what do you mean? He was saying to abide. He was saying, quit striving with God. Quit arguing with God. Quit complaining to God. 
Quit asking God, why aren't you doing what I want you to do? And just sit at God's feet. Because when you sit and gain the knowledge of His Word, when you abide and you drink deeply from His waters and eat of His bread, His bread and His water changes you. How many of you know how quickly food is absorbed through your body after you eat it? Well, I'll help you. How many of you have eaten asparagus? And not to be nasty, within 15 minutes you go to the restroom and you smell that asparagus. That's how quickly food goes through your body. And this spiritual food will do the same thing. If you say, I just don't know what to do, then just sit down for 15 or 20 minutes and just abide with God and watch the changes take place that quickly. Get in the Psalms. Get, get in any place and just say, Lord, I just want to spend time with you. Have you ever got with somebody not to tell them all your problems, not to complain about life, not to beat up on your boss, but just got with someone to sit down and have a cup of coffee and enjoy their fellowship? You ever done that? Try it sometimes. It's pretty good. God says, just sit down with me and have a cup of coffee. Not a literal cup, Leslie. But I mean just take the time you would take to drink a cup of coffee and just talk with me. And then that man said, number two, let the Lord increase your faith. You ever try to make your faith grow? Can I give you a little secret? You can't do it. Your faith only grows as you spend time with Him in His Word and His Spirit begins to reveal things to you. And then you see Jesus in this book. And when you see Jesus in this book, you say, man, that is true. I, I believe that. I heard the preacher say, I didn't really believe him. And my mom and dad said, I knew they were wrong. But now I see it because the Holy Spirit showed it to you. And your faith is strengthened. And your life is strengthened because you've spent time with the Lord. Then thirdly, the man said, learn to find rest in the Lord. In other words, slow down. Be still. Wait on God. It's in the times of abiding and meditation that you develop spiritual fruit. How many of you have a fig tree or an apple tree or a grapevine or any type of fruit tree in your yard? What do you do to help that tree produce fruit? Do you go out there and say, come on now, now, come on apples, you grow now. Do you think the preacher can make you produce fruit? Come on now, you love Jesus now. Are you getting it? Not until you abide like that tree abides. No matter how much the preacher shouts and yells, no fruit's going to come out. Wow, that's interesting. Don't you think so? What did Jesus say? Oh, another thought. Let me tell you why. We say, preacher, why don't I abide? How many of you want to have a few answers why you, well, most people don't abide? Okay, now I'm, now I'm not meddling here. You may think I am, but next picture, Chad. Television, computers, iPads, iPhones, friends, hobbies, activities, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm supposed, the devil has given us everything under the sun to do. And they're fun. And you don't have to think when you do it. Just turn on a ball game. <laughs> Text me. <laughs> you think <laughs> You know? I throw those music things in, huh? Yeah. Yeah, bah. And, and it's, it's just an escape from reality. We say, preacher, when I do it, I'll feel better. Sure, you feel better because you're not 
thinking about what God wants you to think about and overcome. So I just say every day abide with Him. And it's best to abide in the morning and keep those thoughts in your mind all day long if you can. If you would, I skip Matthew 4, 4. We know that. The Lord said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But I want you to come down to meditation. Now, can I just go ahead and tell you this? Meditation is not sitting on your backside with your legs crossed. and <laughs> That's not meditation. But if you ever learn to meditate the way the Lord said to meditate, you'll become brilliant in so many ways. And I, if we don't get any further than these 10 verses, I want to show you. They're all in Psalms 119. Again, if you will turn there and take a pen and circle them and go back and read them tomorrow and the next day and the next day and do your best to just deeply meditate on these, you'll realize, you know what? This is the greatest stuff in the world. This is better than peanut butter and jelly. This is better than eggs and bacon. There's some good stuff here. This is better than the stuff I learned in college. Look at these great verses on wisdom in the book of Psalms. You want your life to be pure. You say, preacher, I'd like for my, my mind to be pure, my heart to be pure, but boy, I have a battle with that because I, I grew up in a way that my mind wasn't pure and my heart wasn't pure. What do I do? Psalms 119.9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Think on God's Word. I, you get devotionals. I know you probably get tired of me giving 10 devotionals on truth. But man, you ought to meditate on truth. They're fantastic. I give you stories with them in case you get tired of the Scriptures. But the truth is fantastic. So how do you have a pure life? You purify your mind by meditating on God's Word. You say, preacher, I have a tendency to wander from God. How do I keep from wandering from God? For God, it says this, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. With my whole heart, God, I'm meaning business with you as a, as a football player gives his whole heart to winning the game. God, I'm meaning business. I want to give you my heart. Fill it with your word. And when you do, it'll keep you from wandering from God. Wow. A third thought, how do I keep from sinning? You know, God, I have, uh, I have this problem. Just the devil hits me up with this same sin every day, every day, every day. Thy word have I memorized. <laughs> Get that? Thy word have I hid in my heart. You say, preacher, you know how old I am? Do you know how long it's been since I memorized anything? And my wife tells me to get, go to the store and get bread and milk, and I bring back ice cream and cookies. I, you know how bad it is. <laughs> Listen, I know it's going to take you longer if you're older, but take the time. Take one verse. Take one chapter. Read it. When you get through, say, what did I read? <laughs> and if you can't remember, go back and read it again. <laughs> And, and after the third time you still don't remember it, get up the next morning and read it again. I mean, I promise you, sooner or later, something's going to sink in. That's what the Lord said. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's a means of keeping from dying. Do you know that? Verse 12. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Did we skip something? Verse 12. Oh, that, I, I did skip something. It gives me a greater desire to know God. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statues. What do you have a desire for every day? You know, I wake up in my flesh and I desire to go back to bed. <laughs> Most of us wake up and we think, you know, I, 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 time for breakfast. Wouldn't it be good if we got up and were thinking on the things of God? First thing I do every morning is read a devotion I wrote the night before. <laughs> And I make changes to it. So every morning, every night, spend time with Him. Desire to spend time with Him. Verse 92 is great. It keeps you from an early death. Look at that. Unless thy law 
had been my delights, I should then have perished mine afflictions. You're going to go through some things in life. Someone asked me, and many people have asked me, can you be a Christian and commit suicide? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Judas wasn't a Christian, okay? So don't say, well, he was, he was saved, but then he got lost. No, Judas never was saved. He was the devil. That's what the Lord said. He had the devil from the beginning. But you can get discouraged in life. You can quit on God. But if you spend time in His Word, it'll keep you from dying spiritually. Okay? Another verse, verse number 97. It's a means of falling in love. Who are you in love with? David, you and Dion are still in love? Good. But this is talking about falling in love with God. Verse 97. Oh, how love I thy law. You know what? When you start reading God's Word, you may not love it. It may not be fun. It may not be enjoyable. But you know what happens as you spend time with Him? Oh, how love I thy law. It's my meditation all the day long. Huh. When you're young, how many of you ever were young at one time and you decide you're going to start jogging? None of you, huh? And that first day, you're on that track. Okay, four times around a mile. 440 yards. I can do it. And about three-fourths of the way around the first lap, you can't even lift your legs. <laughs> Literally. But you've got something a lot of people don't have. You've got determination. And you have discipline. So you're out there the next morning. You make it all the way around this time. Man, I did all right. And after about a month, you're running a mile. And then you bring it down from 12 minutes to 10 minutes. Now, it's a joke if you know about time. <laughs> when the world record is 391 or something like that, and uh, you're a 12-minute mile. Hey, you go out there and you see how long it takes you to run a mile. You, you'll probably be at 12 minutes. I saw a fellow running one time. Honestly, goodness, it was like this. That's a 36-minute mile. You walk at four miles an hour, that's a 15-minute mile. And I'm just saying, when you spend time doing something you learn to love, it grows on you, and that's the best thing you can do. Real quickly, uh, learning wisdom. Thou, through thy commandments, has made me wiser than mine enemies. Are there people that beat you up spiritually with their words and ideas and philosophies that contradict the Bible? Yeah, preacher, I hate it. Meditate. God will make you wiser than your enemies. Because look at the last few verses in that verse. You're always going to have your enemies. There's always... You know what I found out when I was young? People would ask me a question as a Christian, and I didn't have an answer for it. Do you know what I did? Do you think I went and asked my mommy? I went and pulled the book out and studied it till I had an answer. And I wrote down, I had page after page. You know what? No one ever asked me that question the rest of my life. They asked me that question because God was teaching me. Not them. Hmm. You know what else it'll do? Look at verse 99. It'll give you righteous understanding. I have more understanding than all my teachers. How many of you went to college and your teacher taught you something that wasn't true? Ta, ta da. God says, I'll give you more understanding than your teachers. I'll teach you about life in this book. I'll teach you about science in this book. I'll teach you about everything in that book. God said, I'll make you wiser than the wise men of this world. I understand more than the ancient because I keep thy precepts. And then lastly, we all want this one. God says, I'll keep you out of trouble. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Well, that's uh, not the whole book, but time is gone. There's a lot of more interesting stuff in the book. If you like to read it, meditating and abiding, things that will help you out. Uh, talk about the sheep, 
I've done that before in the past about how the sheep has four different chambers in their heart and uh, we are sheep. You know what that sheep is doing? It's chewing its cud. Now your mouth's not going to move like that when you chew the spiritual cud God gives you. But a sheep gets up real early in the morning when the dew was still on the grass. This is how sheep do it. And they eat that grass for a couple hours. And then the sheep goes and he lays down because a sheep cannot regurgitate and chew its cud unless it's at rest. And as he eats that food, it goes into his rumen, and there in the rumen is the grass where the, the stomach begins to churn and separate the little rocks and stones from the true grass, and he spits the stones and rocks up through the esophagus back out of his mouth, and the, the grass that he has chewed has mixed with enzymes, and it is packed over in the reticulum, which is like a, a, a honeycomb, and different packs there, the, the grass that he's chewed up and mixed with enzymes go into those different honeycombs, and he burps up one at a time and chews it. They spend about two hours doing this. Then he swallows it into the omasum. And when he swallows it into the omasum, it's still cellulose mixed with enzymes. And sheep cannot live on cellulose. They cannot live on grass. But in the omasum as well as in the rumen, there are protozoars and bacteria that eats that cellulose and it turns to protein. You can't live on just reading God's Word. You've got to meditate on it. Then it passes into the omasum where the rest of the digestive acts takes place. It moves into the small intestines where the nutrition is fed throughout the entire body and the sheep liveth. And that process takes hours. And so God is saying, you're my sheep. You know my voice. Abide with me and I'll abide with you. So I encourage you, if in life you're great with where you are spiritually, then enjoy your life where you are. But if you say, I'd like to know more, do more, love the Lord more, I'd like to have more victories in my life, I'd like to see him answer more prayers. That's in the, the booklet, I think. I'd like to see him as I abide with him. I'd like my love to grow. I'd like to glorify him. If those are some of the motives in your heart, just do one thing. Or if at work, you say, preacher, I don't know what to do with my boss. And if you've got a boss you don't know what to do with, don't raise your hand. Whatever your situation is, you've been trying to fix it all these years and you had not been able to do it. Neither could Hudson Taylor. And he learned the wisdom to sit at God's feet and abide. And when he learned that, he did the greatest work of any missionary that ever went to China. And so whatever you want to do in life, the wisest thing you can learn tonight is simply to abide. Okay? Father, help us to learn that truth tonight and to abide with you, me as well, to just spend that time thinking on your precious word and growing spiritually. A lot of times we'd like to tackle situations. We'd like to fuss things out and fight things out and fret things out. But God, you've told us to just be still and know that thou art God. Teach us that, Lord, that we might grow nearer to thee and have a greater impact on people around us because of the peace and love and joy you put in our life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. If you got just a couple of minutes, let's have a quick business meeting. Brian, uh, Johnny has... Uh,